Um, thank you for joining us in person and online uh, on behalf of the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law, uh, Wallace Stegner Center, to today's presentation on uh, a Utah success story, Utah statewide water marketing and strategy report and website. Um, before we start, I want to uh, begin with the native lands acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that this land, which is named for the, the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. Uh, we respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach uh, activities. Um, just a reminder that this is the final Stegner Center um, event for the semester. We hope that you can join us next semester um, for the Stegner Center's Green Bag Series uh, and for the Stegner Center's 29th Annual Symposium, which will be titled uh, Transitioning to Renewable Energy, How to Build a Bright Future, and that'll be on March 14th through the 15th. Uh, of 2024. Um, you can find details about the Green Bag series and the symposium online on the Stegner Center calendar. Um, on to today's presentation, uh, we are very excited to, uh, to welcome Emily Lewis today. Um, Emily is a director and shareholder and co-chair of the Natural Resources and Water Law Practice Group with Clyde Snow and Sessions. Uh, Emily assists clients in navigating complex water problems. She also advises individual water right owners, uh, water conservancy uh, districts, municipalities, mining companies, and mutual shareholder irrigation companies. Her strategic project uh, practice extends to innovative policy work and specialty project management. And she presently acts as the Utah uh, Water Banking Project Manager. Um, she also hosts the podcast uh, Ripple Effect, a podcast putting water in context. So you should definitely check that out. Um, uh, a little bit about her talk. So for the past three years, the state of Utah has been working with local water users to pilot the Utah Water Banking Act and develop a broader statewide water marketing strategy. Um, from these efforts, the project management team has developed four pilot projects and a dynamic set of materials and tools for water users to explore water marketing. Um, Utah faces a number of complicated water challenges. Uh, water marketing is uh, one method of assisting Utah in meeting a number of statewide water policy objectives and goals. Um, after Emily's talk, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, so to ask questions, whether you are remote or are joining us in person, um, please follow the instructions posted on the screen. If um, you like a question another um, attendee has asked, please click the thumbs up uh, icon to like that question, which will help it rise to the top of the list. So please join me in welcoming Emily Lewis. All right. Okay, well, I'm very excited to be here. To the intrepid 10 of us in the room, well done. <laughs> but I hear we actually have a very good online following today, so I'm excited to share uh, with uh, everyone here um, the kind of recent developments in our statewide water marketing strategy development or statewide water marketing strategies project. Um, I do want to say one thing before we start. Um, I am an alumni of the law school here, and I'm also a, a prior recipient, recipient of the O'Hara Fellowship, which is a two-year uh, natural resources fellowship uh, at the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I was actually at an event last night where I saw another attorney who was like, oh, are you an O'Hara? And I said, yes. And she goes, oh, it's so exciting to see, you know, the, everyone out in the community and see these young attorneys get out and, and actually, you know, be working with private law firms and working in state government, et cetera. And um, we are currently fundraising for a very similar program to honor Meg Oswald. Uh, Meg was a contemporary uh, of ours who unfortunately passed away about two years ago. And so we really are trying to create a similar program for Meg so that we can have young uh, attorneys work with the Department of Environmental Quality and DEQ. And so um, I don't know what day it is, there's Cyber Monday and Giving Tuesday, so why don't we make this Don't Forget Friday and give a donation to the Oswald Fellowship? So, good, a very good cause to support. 
Okay, so I kind of have a little bit of a hybrid presentation for everybody today. I'm gonna to spend about the first 20 minutes or so in a PowerPoint kind of talking about the project, what we've been doing. And then I think realistically, the more exciting aspect is we're gonna do a real-time walkthrough of our new and recently released um, and yet still under development um, interactive website that is going to give uh, you a really good peek into the tools that are available to the public and ways that individual water users or communities can take advantage of water marketing principles. So the first part is going to be through PowerPoint. The second part is going to be through uh, interactive website. And then I like to leave room for questions at the end because we typically do have a lot of really good questions. So what are we doing here today? So today our purpose is to talk about the statewide water marketing strategies report. This is also kind of known as the Water Banking Act. Um, uh, we uh, originally, it was uh, based on the Water Banking Act and then we've expanded it to be more of a water marketing project in general. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about what we're doing, why does it matter, how's it going, what are we learning, and then what's next. And then we'll move into the pretty exciting website. I don't do a lot of web building. It's been fun to build a website. So it's been a, a really cool project. So what are we doing? So we're at the end of a three-year effort to review and assess water marketing opportunities by piloting the Utah Water Banking Act here in the state of Utah. Um, the actual project deliverable is a statewide water marketing strategies report, associated materials and guides, and a website. So that's kind of what we've been doing here for the last couple of years. Um, we're finalizing the report. That'll be out for public review here in the next couple of weeks, but our website with all the really fun stuff is up and working. So before we get into you know, any of the specifics, one thing we have really run into in this process is water banking is a term that means many things to many people. It depends on kind of where you are, what you're doing, where you're at. Um, here uh, in the state of Utah, between the years of 2017 and 2020, we had a very, very, very robust stakeholder working process where we had basically about 70 different stakeholders meeting on a pretty regular basis to talk about this concept of water banking. And water banking kind of came up because in 2017, we had the confluence of a bunch of different activities. We had the governor's statewide, uh, the governor's water strategy report come out in 2017. We had some discussions about adding in-stream flows to municipal water rights for environmental purposes and, in, and water quality purposes. We had the nascent discussions about ag water optimization, which now is really going in, really going full bore here in the state. Um, and we also had some discussions in some of the larger districts about this concept of banking. So between 2017 and 2020, this stakeholder group kind of was like, well, what does this mean to do water banking? And so we had a bunch of really good working groups that looked at what was happening here in the state of Utah. And then we looked at what was happening in other states around us. You know, what is, you know, what is this concept? And what we came up with is kind of the guiding principle for our Utah project are kind of these three words, voluntary, temporary, and local. And so for here, for today's purposes and for this project, what we're really talking about are mechanisms for water leasing. And so the kind of the theme that the group kind of coalesced around was to better support Utah's growing water demands, Water banking could facilitate local, voluntary, and temporary transfers of water that generate income for water right owners and increase access to water. So from the very get-go, our concepts for the discussion here in Utah were to be very, very locally centered. This was not going to be a state-down program like they have in Idaho, which is a great program, but very different than ours. Um, this was going to be something that would only happen if the local individual water users wanted it to happen. And we were really going to focus on leasing as the mechanism because that kept the income from local water rights and the local water right owners in the local community. So we weren't really talking about buying and selling. We we're really talking about leasing. So from this um, effort, we wrote the Utah Water Banking Act. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. Um, 
so we wrote the Utah Water Banking Act, and then we were like, great, we have this new statutory vehicle, we should probably go test it. So in 2020, we received about $800,000 in funding. And so $400,000 of that was from the state of Utah. I really think the state of Utah and the legislature really deserves a lot of credit in the last five to six years of putting a lot of money behind water. And this is the concrete results of those kind of investments. And so I think it's really important that as we talk about water, we recognize how these projects get funded. And this is partially funded through state funds. The other $400,000 came from a grant from the Bureau of Reclamation. It's a water smart water marketing grant. It's a specific program to help states and water users explore the concepts of water marketing. So this $800,000 received in 2020, this is all pre-pandemic by the way. It feels like a world away. <laughs> um, you know, it was a three to four year project. Origin, you know, we weren't quite sure exactly how long it was going to take us. We've kind of done it in three. Um, we originally had three pilot project areas chosen. Um, we had chosen Cache Valley, Snyderville Basin, and the Price River area to explore the Water Banking Act and other water marketing principles. We actually were so successful that we added a fourth pilot project towards the end of the program. So we really did exceed our original goals in, in testing these principles. And then from that, from what we learned in these pilot projects, we have coalesced our lessons learned into a statewide water marketing strategies report. And so this is basically an assessment of water marketing in Utah. How's it going? What do we think? How, what, what is the temperature? Um, but it's not just water banking. It's much broader than water banking. It's kind of like basic principles about market principles. Like how are we gonna get willing buyer or willing lessors, willing lessees together? Once they're together, how do we actually get to a, you know, a transaction? And then how do we actually get wet water from point A to point B? So much broader than just the Water Banking Act, even though that was kind of like our entry point into the discussion. Um, in doing this, you know, we also kind of identified requirements, we identified barriers that, you know, individuals are running into, we identified opportunities, and we were able to kind of coalesce and synthesize some guidance documents for water users who are outside the pilot project areas who might want to explore this future, in the future. Um, and so from that, we came up with recommendations and then functional tools. And we'll have fun with some of those functional tools here in a minute when we move to the website. So I really think that this is actually a pretty critical slide. You can look at the mini bullet points or as our brains get smaller and we only like shiny things, you can just look at the right hand side that synthesizes everything. So pretty much what are we doing with projects? We are kicking the tires on what it looks like to lease and move water in Utah. And that is a critical function here in the state right now. We have a number of very complex water demands and we really need to get a handle on what it means to physically move water from point A to point B. And so this is what this project is. And then hopefully the lessons learned will be able to roll up into a bunch of other projects, Great Salt Lake leasing, demand management on the Colorado River, water, you know, water quality concerns. You know, this is really intended to be like a multiplier effect project. And, I, and we'll talk about some specific ways that it comes to fruition here in a second. So what are we doing? So we engage stakeholders who are interested in water marketing. We identified local water market conditions. To me, that was the most interesting. I mean, I realistically took macro, micro, micro, micro and macroeconomics in college because I had to. <laughs> and now that we're actually in the world, I was like, oh, these are interesting concepts. Um, we also tested the Water Banking Act because that was, um, you know, the, the, one of the primary purposes of this project. You know, we also assisted with complicated change applications. You know, Utah here is governed by, water in Utah is regulated and overseen by the state engineer. Uh, the change application process is an administrative process that is just critical for a number of things. And so, you know, we were really asking some novel questions for the first time in some of these change applications we applied. Um, you know, this is also both the administrative process, but also the technical process. Um, we got to use some fun advanced shepherding and distribution tools. We got to install some telemetry. Um, you know, we were discovering all the ahas and unknowns. And then for me, the most fun part has been making these kind of dynamic tools. 
so here we are. Um, you know, we are uh, at the end of the project. It's so funny because <laughs> I've been doing this so long and I've probably given like 30 presentations to have be at the end is like very weird. Um, but we're at the end of the projects. We have done all of our project pilot work. We have finalized our strategies. We've reviewed the pilots for lessons learned. And now we're at the kind of public, you know, really kind of the end of our public, uh, our, our public um, out outreach component of this. So now you kind of know the basics of the project. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on the Utah Water Banking Act in specific, because it's kind of one component of the broader project, but I do think it's important to understand a couple of key components of the act. So why did we need a water banking act? You know, leasing is something that people do every day. I mean, water leasing is not a new or a novel concept, but yet in 2017, 2018, when we were first starting these conversations. One of our questions was why is it not happening more and what can we do to kind of like, you know, incentivize these leases? Cause we see them as a good way to, you know, voluntarily move water between water users without having to move to like draconian measures of, you know, making people do things. Um, and so what we did in, in our stakeholder conversations is we really asked stakeholders what they wanted. And so the kind of goal of the act is to address barriers and extend benefits that individual water users requested. And so the act itself basically says locals can design a leasing arrangement that meets local conditions. So kind of like the scale of the lease, the size of the lease, you know, the terms of the lease, you know, who's going to get the money. You know, we had really interesting brass tack discussions about how much of a lease price should go to the administrative costs of the irrigation company that has a secretary that has to answer the phone calls and answer the, you know, open the mail and, you know, how much seems like an appropriate amount. How much should the shareholder in an irrigation company receive from the proceeds of a sale? So we had lots of really good brass tacks discussions about kind of like what's going to happen on the ground. Once these water users have had designed a leasing arrangement that qualifies, they can apply to the Board of Utah Water Resources to have that particular lease approved as a Utah water bank. And so we actually have, let's see, yeah, we actually have two different kinds of water banks that you can have here in the state of Utah. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in the individual pilot projects, but we have a contract water bank which is basically a contract between a set number of parties that you can apply to have the Board of Water Resources you know, approve as a water bank. And that was just to reflect the fact that that's what most people do. So they enter a lease amongst a set group of parties. And so the only tweak we had on that is that to be a contract water bank in the state of Utah, you do have to have a public entity be part of that process so that we uh, protect ourselves from speculation, you know, because one of the benefits of the act that we'll talk about in a second is forfeiture. Um, we have some forfeiture uh, um, water rights subject to a water bank are not subject to forfeiture. And so we didn't want to have a speculation element. Um, the other kind of water bank we have is a statutory water bank. It'll make more sense when I show you the pilot projects, but that's intended to be a middleman who brings together, um, or woman, middle woman, who brings together willing lessors and willing lessees in a local area to act as like a neutral platform. Um, so you know it, that's really supposed to be kind of more like a bulletin board or like a little mo local marketplace. Um, the Water Banking Act is an exploratory act. So it does have a sunset window of 2030. So we're hoping that these couple banks that we have approved now and the ones that are kind of in talks about being created are very successful. And then at 2030, we'll, we will uh, um, opt to extend the, extend the act. So what, a couple benefits of the act is that it really does promote local control. If there's not local interest in water banking, there's not going to be a water bank. So, you know, our job is to give tools to local water users to set something up that works for them, to guide them through the process, um, and so that they really have ownership of this. Um, Utah is a unique state. We don't like top-down government, and that's great. And that's actually worked really well here in the state for, for water. Um, you know, our private irrigation company system is incredibly robust, works really well, and that is all, you know, uh, based on private, private enterprise and private interests. So that's kind of what we wanted here. We wanted to really say local folks are in control. 
The other thing that we did that's a benefit of a water bank um, is that if you apply to be a water bank, you apply for a one-time change application to use that water, water right that is inside the service area of the water bank. And so when people think about water banks, one of the common questions we get is, oh, is this like a storage reservoir? Is this like physically a storage reservoir where like water is held and I go to the reservoir like I would go to a bank? And my answer is maybe. <laughs> um, if that is how local, local individuals wanted to design their bank and they had storage in their system, which actually one of our pilots did, yes, then it is like a reservoir. But really when we're talking about water banking, we're just really more talking about like, a administrative transaction between water right owners and holders. So it, you know, it's it's really just saying point A, we're trying to move water from point A to point B in a way that it hasn't moved before. So that, that's really what we're talking about. Some of the other benefits of the act is that we, um, water rights that are subject to an approved change application are uh, receive forfeiture protections here in the state of Utah. If any of my water law students are listening, they should know this word, but water rights are use of fructory water right, or rights, means you basically, in Utah, like most Western states, the wet water molecule is owned by the public. And then what you get as a water right is the right to use the public's water subject to certain conditions. That's what a use of fructory water right is. And one of those conditions is use it or lose it. So you have to use your water right, otherwise it's no longer valid. And so if you don't use it, it's subject to forfeiture. So we wanted to make sure that there are certain conditions here in the state of Utah. A great example of this is in developing areas with irrigation companies that are selling farmland for subdivisions. A lot of the water that used to be used for irrigation is now, some of it's being used for secondary uses on lawns, but you're not applying water to rooftops and sidewalks and driveways. And so those irrigation companies are really concerned about losing their water rights. And so this is a great way to let them retain full value of their water rights, put them on the market and have them leased for other purposes. That's why we did the forfeiture protections. Um, environmental flows in 2020, we didn't have a great environmental flow statute. In 2022, we blew the top off that, so that's a little bit different. <laughs> um, but at the time when we made the bank, there was very few ways you could do environmental flows, and so that was one of the benefits that act. We also had some condemnation protections because a, a, a frequently expressed concern amongst a lot of our rural water users is that if I put my water up for lease, I'm telling people I'm not using it and they're gonna come take it from me. And so we wanted to give some protections and some incentives to use this tool and not have it be a fulcrum for getting and finding water rights that the state could quote unquote take. Um, the other thing we do is an on off switch. You know, you can choose to use your water in a water bank one year and not use it in the next year to kind of give some more flexibility. Okay, so why does this matter? Like, why did we do all this work? <laughs> why, why does it really matter? Um, you know, developing these water marketing tools and strategies really does help build a resilient water future, and it helps the state of Utah meet a variety of water policy objectives. And so this is my one slide section, <laughs> but this really is a multiplier effect. Water markets incentivize good water management. And so we here in the state of Utah, in the Great Salt Lake Integrated Basin Plan, which is another publicly funded project, um, just released their work plan. It's super exciting, and they're having a really cool open house on December 7th. But one of the, one of the components of that project was doing an assessment of the laws we've passed in the last five years to help with water. It's extensive. We have done a lot of work in a very short period of time. And these are some of the things that we've done. So, you know, our regional water conservation goals we've updated, water marketing helps with that. We've got very robust agricultural optimization efforts happening right now. You know, we're still kind of working through some of the kinks about, you know, tracking and, and, and um, you know, figuring out how to, you know, the efficacy of these programs and, and just the natural, um, the natural progression of something like that. We've got the Great Salt Lake Water Trust, which is intended and specifically uh, created to lease water for the Great Salt Lake. We've got Colorado River Compact issues that are continuing to be uh, uh, something we need to address here. We've got watershed councils. We now have new watershed councils that we didn't have two or three years ago. More are being set up. We've got private property rights. We've got a lot of discussions about what it means to own a water right in the state. 
you know, we've got in-stream flows, HB33, like I just mentioned, we actually have one of the most progressive in-stream flow statutes in the country now. You know, you wouldn't think it, but we do. And so um, we made a lot of changes in 2022. So water marketing is going to be a huge component of, of securing water for in-stream flows. We've got economic transitions in the state. Water marketing is really key for that. And, you know, we don't have a lot of water here. And so at some point in time, we're going to have to have discussions about shortage which we are. So these are kind of programs and policies the state has done in recent years. But then we've also, in, you know, kind of the ancillary and complementary components of that is that each one of those policy programs asks very specific technical questions. You know, are, do we have the tools to shepherd water from point A to point B to meet these policy objectives? Do we have the infrastructure in terms of telemetry and modeling and distribution systems set up so that we can do these policy objectives? Do we have the administrative processes to do some of these things? Before our project, we didn't have a process before the Board of Water Resources to apply for a water bank. So part of this project was creating the administrative process to do it. You know, we've also got a ton of money out right now for infrastructure improvements, just like tons, hundreds of millions of dollars are available in the state of Utah for infrastructure improvements. And so, you know, water marketing helps make those programs be effective. Um, also, like, we just need to get better water data. And so having water markets helps us with like our hydrologic conditions. You know, when people are reporting about how much they're leasing, which is a part of the Water Banking Act, we get a better idea of kind of like how much water would we have, where is it being used, et cetera. Um, public, pu pu private public partnerships, you know, that's another thing we're doing. Oh, my favorite, third to the bottom, you know, legal advancements. How are our laws doing? What can we do to tighten them up? Um, and then I think the kind of my, kind of an unspoken one, but one that becomes more and more relevant is as we kind of have these discussions and use programs like water banking, it's letting us know whether or not our water economy and our water skills are there. I feel like the state of Utah could triple the state engineer's budget and we still would not have enough people to help do all the things that we're doing. They do a great job. They're incredible, great consummate professionals. But the point being is, you know, we've had a lot of retirements in the last 10 years, and there's a lot of need for new professionals at water operation standpoints, at the engineering level. Um, you know, we really do need to build up our water skills and our water economy. Okay, so how's it going? Good. We're meeting the metrics. We are ahead of schedule under budget, and we did more than we thought we'd do. So I will take that as a success. And that is due to the incredible amount of work from hundreds of people across the state of Utah. It's been a really fun project to work on. We have unwrapped the water banking statute. We've created forms and processes for those who are interested in doing water banks. We've done four pilot projects, and we have also created the water strategies elements to kind of help folks explore the broader concepts of water marketing. Um, I put this uh, slide in every single presentation I do about water banking because I love it because I feel like this is my life and this lady with the plates, I just like relate to her at like a base visceral level. Uh, so this is kind of where we are. You know, this whole project has been a five ring circus. It's not the Olympics, even though it could be now. <laughs> um, it's not the Olympics, but I felt like that was like each one of the rings was a pilot project and we had another ring for the administrative conversations we had with the state state employees. Like it's been a, a lot of activity all at once, but overall it's gone really well. Um, so the next step is I'm not gonna talk a lot about the individual pilot projects in this PowerPoint, but I'm gonna give you a quick overview and then we're gonna go to the actual website to kind of look at kind of what our pilot projects did. So our first pilot project was in Cache Valley and this was a really interesting one because originally we started out talking with four or five different irrigation companies. And our original thought was that we were going to knit together these irrigation companies into a statutory water bank. And that's what we thought would happen. And then what we found out is we got up there and through a series of questions and through a series of meetings, what we realized was, 
everybody wanted water at the same time when nobody had water. And so this was a great example of like, you sincerely do need very basic market principles to exist to have a water market. It sounds very simplistic when you say it out loud, but those are the kind of questions you actually really need to get into the brass tacks of asking. So we determined in Cache Valley that we really didn't have the right balance of supply and demand. And so um, from that, we derived a bunch of questions that water users can work through to assess supply and demand in their local area. And I'll show you those here in a second. But the other thing that was cool about this project, though, is even though we didn't get a statutory water bank created like we thought we would, we had a two-party late-season lease pool happen. And so two of the parties were like, hey... You know, this doesn't, you know, the big thing doesn't work, but this could work for two of us. And so they didn't create a water bank, but they ended up doing a, a lease between the two of them, which is something they've been talking about for decades. And then we finally, they finally were like, oh, now is the time to do this. So we got a successful water transaction up in Cache Valley. The other thing that was really interesting is that the parties had storage, a storage contract in Hiram Reservoir, which actually is a federal reservoir. And here in the state of Utah, most of our reservoirs are federal reservoirs. And so it was interesting to talk about how a water leasing project could work inside a federal reservoir. And so that ended up working out because the two parties who wanted to do the lease were two of three members of an association and the association held the contract with the federal government. So we didn't have to actually, we talked to the BOR, but we didn't actually have to amend their contract at all. But that's gonna be a key consideration, especially in the Colorado River drainage. Okay, Price River. So Price was super fun. I love everyone in Price. It's a great part of the state. So this was a first, this is our first contract water bank in Utah. We developed the process and the form for a contract water bank. So it was also the first change application. The lessons we learned were to work early and often with the state engineer. Um, and then um, in those discussions, we also had discussions about like what kind of water is going to be subject to lease. We originally started out talking about, you know, what if we pipe the canal? What if we use all the carrier water? And what if we use the water at the end of the canal? And ultimately, we determined that for now, you know, the leasable water was the consumptive portion of the water right. But I think those other conversations are coming and will be part of the project, part of the broader discussion about water marketing and leasing in the state. So this ended up being a contract water bank. It was a contract between the parties. We'll talk about a little bit more about that here in a second. Um, but a really great discussion amongst uh, four, five or six parties um, ended up with a contract water bank. We ended up using that as the, the, the template for creating the process to get a contract approved with the Board of Water Resources. So really good, good work. So the fourth, the third official pilot project was Snyderville Basin. So this was a, um, we also thought that a statutory water bank might work up here in Snyderville Basin because um, really the goal here was to create uh, in-stream flows in East Canyon. Um, and I've said this before, but my favorite project, my favorite term of this project was that they were having, uh, basically the water was too hot in September. So all the fish were dying. And so our term was irreparably stressed. <laughs> They're not coming back. <laughs> And so we were trying to find ways to uh, increase in stream, increase flows in East Canyon during a certain period of time. And so this was a great discussion because at the end of the day, we really couldn't get a lease going because we didn't have enough information about flow data. We really didn't know how much water we actually needed to meet our objectives. And so the cool thing about this project is that aside from creating a bunch of cool templates and questions for creating a statutory water bank that came in handy later, we actually installed six different telemetry sites in a two mile stretch. So we actually have the flow data now that these parties can now later go and decide if they can find water for the lease that they need. So the other thing that was interesting is we had some really good discussions about creative distribution. Maybe we don't need more water. Maybe just not everybody should take their water at 2 a.m. on July 15th. You know, maybe we just need a more of an organized structure amongst private water rights, kind of like they do in an irrigation company. Okay. Our fourth pilot project that kind of snuck in there right at the end was the Uinta Basin. And so this was a project between Ashley Valley Water, Sewer, and Improvement District 
Vernal City and a private corporation named Wedex that does an electronic water trading platform, which is very cool. Um, so this ended up being the st first statutory water bank in the state of Utah. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about these when we go to the website here. Um, and what's neat about this one is that this worked really well because all the parties were already all together. So in this case, Ashley Valley had already been distributing water between various irrigation companies in the area. And so what it allowed us to do is because the parties were already working, you know, what we were able to do is basically, you know, scaffold on the Water Banking Act onto an existing project. And then we're going to try to use an electronic dashboard so that individual water users can have better information about the leases. And then once that gets going, we anticipate it will add on new services for like adding in new irrigation company share leases and kind of expanding the market in the local area. So it worked out really well because these guys were kind of already set up to do this. And I think in assessing whether or not your local area is a good place for a bank, this is some of the things to keep in mind, is how well are the parties already functioning? So, okay. So what did we learn from all that? Um, we learned a lot, we learned a lot. So we learned that we probably wanna do a couple of tweaks to the water banking statute. Most of them, it actually worked pretty well. A couple of the things we found were like, uh, right now there's a prohibition on using groundwater and surface water in the same bank. And we realized that that's not really reality with like exchanges and wells, like people use their water a lot more conjunctively than, than we um, understood. And so we might make that change. Um, it helped us assess fit and form for marketing, market forces. Um, it allowed us to kind of identify marketing tools and techniques. It really brought out what are the key things you need in a water lease. Um, it really highlighted what are our distribution issues. And then one of the big things that we also learned is pricing. There is not a lot of water pricing in the state of Utah. And so it's very hard. You can get all the parties together. You can get this beautiful contract going. And then where we found things, conversations break down was, well, what is the value of this? And so one of the things that we need to do in the state is maybe create a more publicly available database for water leasing, pricing, and sales. But what we really learned, which was super fun, and we'll show you here in a second, is that from all of these discussions, we basically boiled this down into every single transaction, basically hits five key milestones. And so they are people, you have to engage the participants and you have to ask the right questions from the very get-go. You have to, once the people are in the room, you have to assess your market conditions. Do you have the right supply and demand matches? You know, it seems simple, but people got caught up there. And the reason why we did these marketing milestones, one second before I go through them all, is that what we found when we went into these pilot project areas is that everyone was really excited to do this, but nobody knew where to start the conversation. And so the reason for doing these milestones is to really kind of like order the thinking and the conversation so that people could kind of have a guide for how to even talk about water marketing and how to do that in a way that made sense in chronological order for getting things done. Because we would have everybody in the room and then they quickly go to, yeah, but how do we get the water there? And it's like, yeah, well, we don't need to talk about how we get the water there unless we know that there's water to get there. So this is really the goal of the milestones is to, um, you know, give you some, some, give you some guidance. So first milestone is people. Second milestone is markets. You know, um, do you have right, right match of supply and demand? The third milestone is logistics. You know, this is both the legal and the physical feasibility of moving the water. Can you, you know, are you trying to lease a 2023 water right that's only available once every 30 years? You probably need to look at your water rights. Is that a good water right you even want to lease? Can you physically get it? Do you have a connection through a canal company? Do you have wells? You know, can you logistically move? Can you logistically do what you want to do? Our fourth milestone is transactions. You know, like what are the leasing arrangements? How long do they lease it for? What price do they lease it for? We found that most of the parties ended up, um, you know, with this, you know, with this project, we had two complete, two contracts completed, and then the Ashley Valley will have 
a whole nother set of contracts completed and they all have kind of like a key set of terms, you know, like what is the volley back and forth between lessor and lessee in terms of how much is available this year at what price, you know, getting a schedule for that. Um, you know, how, you know, who's going to administer it is the secretary of the irrigation company going to literally receive the forms like that kind of stuff. Like how do you actually get your transaction going? And the fifth milestone is approvals. You know, if you're doing a water bank, not an independent lease, you need to get approval from the Board of Water Resources and working through that process. If you're doing um, an independent lease, you may need approval from the irrigation company board, um, whomever. So just making sure you have all your approvals there. You know, the other thing that we learned is um, we created, and we'll talk about these here in a second, you know, these milestones are really kind of like the key project deliverables. You know, this is really the key elements we, we ended up coming from the project. But then we have a bunch of information that is helping each one of these milestones get unpacked. And so we've got, you know, what does it mean to make a statutory bank? Um, here are three things that you could do for the statutory bank. We've got these transaction types and, you know, questions about, you know, can you, who has responsibility for what, you know. Um, so we have all these really fun materials that kind of break down each one of these areas so that not only are you asking the right questions, but then you actually have documents that help you get to where you need to go. Okay. So which means they're all on this awesome website that we have. And so what I wanna do is spend four or five minutes going through the website and then leave the time open for questions. 1.15, is that about right? We're ending? Okay. So this is our website. We're actually gonna physically go here in just one second. Um, but everything we have is now on this website. It's uh, hosted by the Department of Natural Resources, Division of Water Resources. Um, so it's publicly available and a lot of fun things to poke through. Um, our next immediate steps, we're going to post the draft report on the website. We're finishing that up right now. Um, we are receiving feedback on the website just this morning. We had a, a meeting. We're going to make some changes based on feedback we received in the last couple of weeks. You know, we're going to get our final report to the Board of Water Resources, not on December 5th. I should have updated that, but I'm going to report to them tomorrow about how we're, or next week, how we're doing. But by the end of the year, we'll have our final report. Um, the next thing we need to do is make water banks and lease water. So, I mean, everything's available and ready to use. So that's kind of where we are. Okay, we'll leave that there. Um, now I want to actually go to the website itself and show you kind of some of the fun things that we have. Uh, okay, so this is actually the... Utah Water Marketing Strategies and Utah Water Banking Act website. So this is live right now. If you went on the web, this is what you would see. Um, there's a presentation very similar to this that we gave at our open house on, on November 7th. So if you have friends who weren't able to attend today, there's already a great video on the website to kind of give you the overview. We're here today. But down here is kind of where we are um, in terms of where you can find useful materials. So we are going to do a little bit of a reorganization based on some feedback, but everything that's up now is still going to be up. It just might be organized a little bit. Um, we've got some super fun things like we made some great videos that kind of take you through. Curious about water marketing in Utah? This video is for you. You'll yeah. learn about five key milestones that will help you navigate water marketing. People, oh. transactions, and approvals. Consider this your place in Utah. Our project team worked with local stakeholders across the Beehive State from 2020. We don't need to watch the whole thing, but basically it's a synopsis of kind of the project and the milestones. We've got some really great videos. Um, we've got some, um, you know, to kind of like guide this water marketing project. This is, this is an item that we're going to make a lot more prevalent on the website. But like I said earlier, you know, what we did with these five milestones is we broke the conversation down into key, extremely specific questions. So basically each milestone has a series of questions. And so the intent is that you should be able to print this off, take it to your local water users, walk through these questions and see where you're at. And so these questions are things like, why are you here? <laughs> like, it seems so simple, but you would get people in a room and they would have very different reasons for being there. So, you know, like, why are you here? 
Is there someone invested to do this? This is gonna take a lot of time. If you don't really wanna do this, don't do it, you know? But if you're really excited about it, make sure you've got your champion, make sure you've got the people in the room who really need to be there, you know, examples of who should be here, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, you know, um, you know, is there anyone else that shouldn't be here? And then we even have exercises, you know, like here's some like list of the people who you think should be here who aren't here. Um, this one's a really good one, the market, you know, you know, are there water users in the area who want water but do not have it? When do they want it? How much do they want? I mean, these are seem simplistic, but these are really the questions you need to walk yourself through to get to the end result, you know? And then we also went through, you know, what, what are the sources you have in here? Do you have storage rights? Do you have surface rights? What kind of water rights are we actually talking about? You know, um, are the supplies available? You know, when do the shortages occur? You know, when, um, you know, are these supplemental water rights? And then what we actually found the most helpful is Cache Valley was our example for this, is we had a couple meetings and then we took, said, okay, you guys go home and write five transactions that you think would happen in your valley. You know, just really specifically, I think I could lease water from hiring an irrigation company and take it over to Wellsville Menden, you know? And what we found in our original conversation is that they couldn't do that. And that's when we figured out that this wasn't the right market. And so really trying to like have some really specific things that people could go through. Same thing with logistics. You know, here's some conveyance questions. Here's the distribution questions. You know, in our Snyderville pilot project, they didn't have enough information on flow. So these distribution questions would have actually walked them through that to say, well, I'm glad you want to lease for in-stream flows. How much do you need? And can you actually track that? And they would have said, no, we can't. So that's, that, that's what these questions are designed to do. So basically, you know, these are, you know, one of our tools. This is just one of our kind of like our basic tool to get people started on, do, is there a market, potentially a water market here in your local area? So that is our water marketing milestone. We call it our foundational questions document. Um, we're gonna do some reorganization to kind of make it more apparent here on the website. Um, there's only so much you can do in short periods of time. So there might be some reorganization, but we're gonna bring these things up. Um, some of the other marketing strategies that we have too, this is another document that's gonna be kind of a little bit more reorganized. But you know, once you get to your discussion about water marketing, you know, a lot of the things, the next kind of barrier we had is like, great, now that people are here, now that we know what's gonna happen, you know, what, is, what, what should our transaction actually look like? And so we actually kind of broke things down to saying, here's our transaction types, you know, basically like, you know, what is our actual agreement gonna look like? And then what is our method? Like, how are we gonna bring the people together? Is this just a contract? Is this a bulletin board? Like, what is this? Like, how are you gonna bring your water, your water users together? And then what we've done is that, you know, for example, here's transaction types. So this is kind of like the one, one uh, one access of the grid you just saw. You know, here's like a, here's five transaction types as a summary. But then what we did is we actually said, now you could go home and print this out and be like, oh, well, here's kind of like, here's how a one year lease could work. Here's how a multi year lease could work. Here's the typical sellers. Here's the typical buyers. Here are your benefits. You know, here's a purchase option agreement. You know, kind of really saying like, what's going to be the best fit for us to get what we want to get done? So we kind of are trying to break this out into very specific information and criteria that water users could use. Same thing with our water marketing methods. So, you know, and we're going to do a little bit of changing here on this one today, but generally like, you know, here's a negotiated agreement, you know, like here's what, you know, here's a marketing methods are kind of the platform that people get together. And so we actually gave like real world examples. You know, here's an auction. You know, if you and your area want to do an auction, here's a good example of uh, the Seattle Moxie Irrigation District in Washington. They've got a great water auction, you know, really good one you can model yourself off of. And so just kind of very giving very specific information that water users can use and kind of like print out these materials be in their little group and say, this looks like it could work for us. This one won't work for us and kind of give them very specifics. And so kind of once you have all those materials kind of, you know, for you, 
you know, there's kind of two, we're going to reorganize this a little bit to kind of be more specific for water marketing and then more specific for water banking. But so for water marketing, we've kind of got the milestones and the marketing strategies. And then if you think that, you know, a water bank is one of the best options for you, here are some really great, um, you know, here's all the information you need to actually apply to the Board of Water Resources. So this is, you know, the contract water bank application. So once you've kind of got your contract to get together, you've used the resources and you have your contract together, you know, here's actually the application that you would go use and you would submit to the Board of Water Resources. So we have all the administrative items that, you know, you would need. And then we also have some, uh, you know, kind of supplemental materials like, um, you know, for example, here, if you want to do a statutory water bank, you know, here's, a, here's the checklist of all the things that you would need to do a statutory water bank. You know, you need to identify all these. Here's what the statute requires you to do to do a statutory water bank. So there's actually a lot of information on this website. Like, it's, we're, now that we are three years out, we're like, wow, we've, now we need to tell people how to find it. <laughs> so there's a lot of information on this website, but we're hoping that you people will take it, take it to heart, you know, go really look through it, you know, hopefully find it useful and hopefully find it as an empowering tool for local users to really kind of like jumpstart this process. You know, the goal here is to be a laboratory of democracy, put all the information out there and kind of see what local users come up with. So there's a lot on here. I won't go through much more because I'd like to leave some room for questions. But just real quickly, since I didn't talk tremendously about it, you know, if you want to learn more about our independent pilot projects, here's our four pilot projects. Um, I'm going to pick Snyderville, for example. Um, you know, each page opens up. And this is kind of like gives you kind of like some more specifics. Like here's, a, you know, here's our Snyderville pilot project, its status. And then, you know, this one was the um, uh, one that we needed more information on. And you can kind of go to cool things like here are the actual six telemetry sites that have real-time information that we installed, you know, to get more information. And so, yeah, I just always think it's really helpful to bring people back to very specific, concrete examples. And so if you're getting lost in our fancy documents, just come back to some of the pilot projects and kind of see what they did to see how the other folks in the state have, uh, you know, really applied these principles on the ground. So um, I love to leave room for questions because we usually have some. So I think, you know, please go to the website, you know, please poke around it. We're going to be doing some updates and a little bit of reorganization here um, in, the, in the next week or two, but all of the information is up now. It just might be in a little bit of a different place if you go there. And then we are also going to have, right now we've got two videos. We have Water Marketing 101 and then a video that's specifically about the Water Banking Act. We're going to have a video that walks us through all the tools and templates that we'll, we need to wait for the website reorg. And then we'll have a pilot project video too. So, Thank you, Emily. That was such a fascinating um, talk and yeah. uh, really promising um, project and thank you for your work. So we had two clusters of questions. Um, so have the audience members are really interested in the relationship between um, water banking and the Great Salt Lake. Um, so one audience member uh, points out that Utah River uh, Organization says that Utah is way behind the eight ball with regard to a plan for the Great Salt Lake minimal level restoration and um, the legislature won't even allow discussion of a healthy minimum lake level goal. Um, so if you could speak uh, I have about... so many thoughts on this question. I'm going to have to actually like make sure that they're appropriate for the public audience. Um, yeah. And then a follow up to that question, Professor um, Daniels asks if there are any legal changes in Utah that could help in efforts to save the Great Salt Lake in relation to uh, water banking. Um, another audience member asks, how could the Great Salt Lake Trust benefit from the Water Banking Act? So if you could speak to those. So questions. I think overall, the first question, I actually think the first question is really important. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to um, be dismissive of that question at all, because what it does is I think it speaks to, there's still a disconnect between um, public awareness of what's happened and what has actually happened. And so 
the state of Utah is in an, in an acute crisis. The Great Salt Lake is an acute crisis. That is real, you know, and the public feels it. Everyone should feel it. Like that is a real thing that deserves real answers. And so, um, so by, no, by no means being dismissive of the extent of the, uh, the extent of the problem. And so my personal opinions on this are that um, the, the state of Utah has actually, in the last five or six years, modernized its water law. It's done 100 years of changes in five years. And so I really think that um, a lot of it is um, letting some of those programs get on the ground, get stood up, get working, tweak where we need, and kind of see where we're at. But um, you know, there are definitely groups out there that have different opinions about the scale and scope of PACE. I don't think the facts on the ground always reflect that. Um, for example, uh, the just next week they're going to release the, or they have released the Great Salt Lake Basin Integrated Plan, which is an integrated plan for the Great Salt Lake. And so I think that state officials work very, very hard at finding good and practical solutions. Uh, water banking is one of those, and I, and I just think it's really important to recognize that this is a state-funded activity. So I have colleagues in other states who are like, so the state of Utah funded you to do this? And I was like, yeah, the state is really invested in innovative solutions. The problem is it's a big problem. You know, there's just not enough water in the state. And so the reality is, is some of it is that, you know, if there were a magic lever to pull to bring water to the Great Salt Lake in a, in a very quick and fa you know easy fashion, that lever would have already been pulled. And so I think that the solution is, and I say this quite regularly, you know, like a silver buckshot solution. You know, this marketing project is a multiplier effect because you know now we can really say instead of having to be like, oh, how do we move water? How do we get people talking about this? They're talking about it. Now, how do we direct the energy in a way that works? And so, um, you know, like the Great Salt Lake Trust is another great example. You know, um, that's a program that is working through many of the same questions that we just worked through. And so the goal is from some of the lessons learned in this project to help those other programs expedite their work. And so, I really think the state should get more credit for the work that they've done because they really have done a lot from conservation goals to uh, integrating land use planning to, um, you know, uh, uh, our ag optimization programs. I mean, we're talking billions of dollars of investment in a short period of time. It's just going to take a little bit of time to see the results of those projects. Got it. Thank you. So the second group of questions asks about the um, uh, the process of scaling up water banking. So one audience member um, asks, um, it seems like the problem um, is a lack of trust that users have in things like water markets and banking. Is that your experience? Um, someone else asks, um, is water banking just a tool for local water scarcity uh, among water users? And um, if, if not, can this be scaled up? And if so, what are the biggest barriers? Yeah. So um, I think distrust is, I, I think that I don't really like the term distrust because I don't really think that's an accurate representation. I think it's just that we're asking people to do novel things and that takes some time to settle in. You know what I mean? And so we found, I mean, we in our in our project, we had three pilot projects or people who already raised their hands. So we knew that those people were going to participate. And then we had a fourth pilot project. In the semi-arid state of Utah, demand for water is growing. It is. But at the same time, our water supply is shrinking. I like that one the best, actually. Um, but so I think that, you know, I think that it's not necessarily distrust. It's just it just we're, we have to do things a little differently. And that just takes some time to really process what that actually is going to look like on the ground. And so we had three pilot projects that raised their hand that wanted to participate. We had a fourth pilot project that I literally told them no like six times. And they were like, no, we really want to do this. And I was like, OK, cool, we'll do it then. And so and I'm really glad we did because it turned out to be a great project. And then we probably had like 11 or 12 other discussions with potential water banks. So I don't think there's any lack of interest. I just think it's um, figuring out if it's going to work in a particular area. So I think interest is high. Um, I think for the scalable question, um, yeah, I mean, these are intended to be more local. These are intended to be for like local water demand and local issues. But the reality is, is that that's how water works in general. And I can foresee maybe potentially in the future 
you know, a series of small projects do aggregate and roll up into a larger scale project. Like I think, um, you know, there's just very low hanging fruit of large amounts of water exactly where we want it. And so, you know, we're going to have to think about, you know, those kind of questions of how do small pictures, small pieces add up to bigger pieces. Got it. Um, so our last question is a clarificatory question. Um, you mentioned that Utah's water law works well and pointed to irrigation systems as, as an example, but it also seems like um, there's a need to increase in-stream flows to, to East Canyon and many of our rivers and lakes suffer. So can you clarify um, what you think about our existing uh, water law regime? So I am an advocate for the prior appropriation doctrine. I will say that very clearly. Um, we actually did a really good Stegner Center in January, Jan? Yeah. So we did a Stegner Center uh, conversation in January that's on the Stegner Center website that is when I did that's from my personal perspective about the prior appropriation doctrine, um, where I think it kind of gets a bad rap because it was built in 1850 and the world looked very different in 1850. And in 1850, our immediate public priorities were homes, irrigation, industry. But the actual doctrine itself as we talked about earlier, you know, is built on this use of fructory principle. And so the conditions that we set on the public's use of water are can change and, and change with society. And that's really what we have done. And if you look at, you know, prior to 2022, it was very difficult to get in-stream flow leases. You know, we had a very restrictive regime. It wasn't seen as a beneficial use. And now, as long as you work with one of the agencies that has, you know, a, a in-stream flow need that meets with their mission, you know, we have a very flexible in-stream flow statute. Um, that's a very new law, and we are still working through what that means on the ground, um, but we have changed the law to meet that need. And so I think that's just a very clear-cut example of us changing our water laws. Another one is SB 277 that came out last year. Um, that is our agricultural optimization project um, program, and they created in law the a new right to saved water. So if you s use less water than you have traditionally used for your irrigation practices, under law now, there is a way that you can have that recognized and applied to new uses. That is a direct change to our use it to lose it principles. And so we are very actively working through these problems, but they are complex and they are complicated and they're technical and we also want to get it right. And so I think what we're dealing with here is um, just a little bit of, you know, trying to meet public, legitimate public angst because it's legitimate and, you know, making sure we're working at a pace that we have results that are not only effective, but also results that are gonna be long lasting. And we wanna make sure the things we're doing really work in the long run. So I think the state's done a very good job. We can always do more, but I think that we've made a lot of progress in the last couple of years. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, and I uh, want to uh, ask everyone to join me in thanking Emily Lewis again for her wonderful talk. I know there's more of you out there. <laughs>